want to pick up where I left off last week. We started this teaching and um, on the whole issue of the fact that you have been placed to realize God's purpose for ministry. And we were not able to finish the teaching, so I want to pick that up a little bit this morning and explain some things a little deeper and a little further with the intent of motivating all us to become involved in, in ministry and to be mobilized to be who God would have us to be. So I am trusting that you would grace me this, this morning to teach a little bit. Can we do that this morning? Just to teach a little bit. So I just, there's some important principles that I want to share with you. And I hope uh, on Wednesday night we'll be able to unfold that a little bit more. So just be gracious as we kind of walk through this this morning that God would move and have his way. Uh, let me pray and then we're going to go to the word and allow God to move. Holy Spirit, you're wonderful. Holy Spirit, you're gracious. Holy Spirit, you're merciful. Holy Spirit, you're kind, God. So as we approach your word, um, the song just still resonates in my heart. It's only you, Christ alone, that can do it all. So we thank you for that, Lord. So as we go to your word, uh, speak through me. Felix moves out of the way, as I often say. Speak to your people, God, so we can hear and be what you would have us to be, God. So we love you this morning. We bless you. We praise you. Uh, may your word go forth in power and in might, Lord. And convict and prick a heart to bring somebody closer to you and a deeper relationship with you. So we bless you and have your way. In your name we pray and thank you. Amen and amen. Amen. Now do me a favor. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, whether you realize it or not, you have been placed here to realize God's purpose for ministry. Yeah, yeah, amen. Now find somebody else to look them in the eye. Come on, find somebody. Yeah, we, we kind of engage and interact a little bit here, so we make you uncomfortable. Say, neighbor, neighbor, you have been placed here to realize God's purpose for ministry. Amen. I want to, I want to if I may use the term and be so bold as to say, bring some added value to you this morning as you've been teaching on this last week. And uh, I just want, I'm on the back end of that, so I want to finish this up. And next week, we're going to go to the next uh, place that God would have us to go. Here's where we begin this thing by way of introduction. Um, I thought it was important that we all realize that uh, when God starts a thing, this is what I said last week, everything that's needed for God to accomplish what he wants done is already existent, right? Um, in the words of Miles Monroe, to restate it this way, when purpose begins, provision is already provided. And some of the way I flesh that out with you is I talked about Jeremiah 1 and 5, where God said, before I formed you uh, in the womb, I knew you and I ordained you to be a prophet. Then we looked at Jeremiah 29, where he said, I know the plans that I have for you. And he spelled out what those plans were, plans to prosper, plans to make your your name great. Then looking at Proverbs, right, where he says, a lot, many of the plans of a person's heart, but it is God's purposes that prevails, right? And we spend an extensive amount of time in the book of 1 Corinthians looking at the fact that we are a body and that um, as members of the body, we play a critical role for what God would have us to be. So two of the points that we were able to flesh out last week by way of review is number one, God placed you at Restoration Christian Fellowship because of the unique ministry or mission that he gave um, this ministry to do. And we spent some time Wednesday rehashing that. This is where I wished the majority of you would come out on Wednesday night because we really engaged in dialogue. We're able to talk through some extensive things to look at that because you'll understand with God, he is not a haphazard or mad scientist where he has to experiment. Everything God does, he does with intention. Amen? You got, you got to lock into that. He does it with intention. So we spent, just, just go online and listen to that sermon. It's going to really help bring legs to some of the things that I'm going to share with you. So number one, he placed you here. Don't make the mistake of thinking, I made the decision. You might have ended up there after God spoke, but God spoke first, and then our response is based on what God said. Then the second thing we looked at, when God places you here, it's very important that you know he does it with intention. So that means that you play a critical role in Restoration Christian Fellowship, realizing its mission, its vision in the community. Here's what that means. We cannot do this without you. Y'all say amen. 
Amen? We need you. You can't, it's, it's like the old Uncle Sam military poster back in the day with the finger pointing, right? We need you. You play a critical role, and we can't do it without you because God placed you in a body so the body can function holistically and be all that he wants it to be. Every part, every member, every part of, of, of the, the human anatomy plays a critical role, and the same thing transfers over to us as members of the body of Christ. We each play a critical role. Now, where we left up was that second point, and where I want to pick up today is I want us to look at this point and we're going to talk to it and flesh it out as we go through. If it can get the third uh, thing on the screen is that you must understand that God now has uniquely gifted you with the spiritual gifts needed to help Restoration Christian Fellowship realize its mission in the community. Now that goes in line with whenever God does something All the parts, all the pieces, all the components that's necessary for that thing to do what God wants done exists. So here's what you need to know about yourself, okay? That if you name the name of God, in other words, if you are a child of God and accepted Christ in your life as personal Lord and Savior, you have in you everything you need for us to do what God wants us to do here, okay? Point to yourself and say, self, it's in me. Come on, one more time. Say self. It's in me. It doesn't matter what no one else tells you or what anybody says. It's very important that you understand that God has gifted, God has empowered, and God has placed that in you. So what I want to do for the next few minutes, and then we'll come back and revisit this subject matter on the back end, is I want to lay um, some biblical foundations leading up to this statement that we just made and flesh it out for you so you can see it. Amen? And what I want to do is go with me to the book of John. Let's start there. And there's these scriptures that we're going to talk through. And I'm going to narrate the majority of them because we don't have time to read them off. Wednesday, we're going to get to go a little deeper. And I know I may surface or raise some issues that may be a little counter to your theological framework or theological upbringing. So come out on Wednesday. We'll be able to engage them and dialogue with them. So here's the first thing I want you to understand. Your gifts... Um, 3A, were given to you by God. Okay, very, very important that you understand that, that the gifts were given to you by God. And so here's why God gave you the gifts, and then we're going to talk through this in scriptures. He gave you the gifts. Um, wow, that says 3AA. Messed that up. Uh, he gave you the gift so that you can replicate Christ's work, Christ's apostrophe S, his work in the earth realm. Okay, here's what's happening When you notice, if you're in the book of John chapter 14, um, that whole 14th chapter begins this dialogue where Jesus is talking to his disciples saying, I am the way, right? I am the truth. I am the life. No man comes or no person can come to the Father except through me. Now, here's what you need to know about Jesus. His earthly ministry was not comprised solely of attending church on Sunday morning and possibly Wednesday night and then going home throughout the entirety of the week and doing nothing about his calling or his preordained destiny, right? If you know Jesus... Um, He would go to synagogue as was his custom. Luke chapter 4 talks about that. But then at the back end of that fourth chapter of the book of Luke, he talks about that the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me to preach the good news to the poor, to set the captives free, to open up blinded eyes. Come on, y'all know this passage quite well. So here's what that looked like. Once he left the synagogue on, on Sunday evening, notice what he did. He would go about in the community ministering to those who had need. So you would find him, if there was a funeral procession going on, he would stop the funeral procession and he would raise the dead. Come on. If if there were hospital visits that needed to be done, he would go in the hospital visit and he would heal the sick. If there were blinded eyes that needed to be opened, guess what he would do? He would open up the blinded eyes. Come on, y'all know this. If if there were lake lame that needed to walk, he had a way of making the lame walk. If there were people that were hungry and needed to be fed, he had a way of feeding the five thousand. And what's paramount with what I'm sharing with you, that was not his Sunday morning ministry. That was his Monday through Friday ministry. Come on, talk to me. Right? Now, chapter 14 picks up and he's about to leave the scene. And he has an audience of 12. 
His disciples are sitting around him, and he's about to say to them, I'm about to leave the earth. I am about to go back to my father, but the things that you just saw me do or you've seen me do for the past three years, here's what he says, greater than these shall you do. Oh my gosh, you got to get that. You kind of get what I'm saying. Because here's what he's communicating with them. It's only one of me. Right? It, it, thank you, Sherry. It's 12 of you. And if one of me can do all this, imagine what 12 can do. Right? And, and I think I'm comfortable in saying that you and I are here today as a result of the work of the 12 after he went on to, to glory to be with his father. We are the recipient or the, the direct descendants or benefactor of the ministry that they did in the earth realm. Now, unlock into this. If he says, greater things shall you do, and 12 has done so much that they influence you and I to be here, imagine what 500 could do. Oh, my gosh. Imagine, imagine, uh, Cassandra, what we all could do if the church would get on board and realize who God is. So he says, you see me heal the sick. You see me raise the dead. You see me feed the hungry. You see me, come on, clothe the naked. You see me open blinded eyes. But that's just one of me impacting a little locale. And imagine what can happen in Aurora. Oh, y'all don't hear me today. Yeah. Imagine what can happen in Colorado, right? Imagine what can happen in the world if we can understand how Jesus did what he did. So what he does, he says that in, in verse 12 of chapter 14, that, the, that um, we here to replicate the work in his Christ's work in the earth. But then in verse 15, he tells us how we are able to do it. The only way you're able to do these things is with the presence of of the Holy Spirit in your life. I need two people to say, I need the Holy Spirit. Come on, say it again. Say, I need the Holy Spirit. Very, very, very important that you not miss that. So I want to read that. I want us to look at this. So here, what we have happening here in John chapter 14, you get down to verse 15, right? And he begins this process now of speaking to his disciples. And notice what he says in verse 15. I'm in the ESV. If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. Look at what it says in verse 17. You know him, for he dwells with you, and he will be, I love this, in you. And look at the next phrase. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Let a little while and the world will see me no more. But you shall see me because I live. You also will live. In that day, he says, you will know that I am the Father. I am in my Father and you in me and I in you. Right? And look at verse 25. But these things I've spoken to you while I am with you. But the, whole, the, the helper, and he defines the helper, the Holy Spirit whom the Father will send in my name, he will do what? Teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Now here's what's happening in chapter 14, verses 15 on, right? He's telling them, pre previously in verse 12, what you saw me do, you're going to do greater. Then he says, how are you able to do these greater things? The reason, the way you're able to do it is because the Holy Spirit will come in you. The Holy Spirit will be with you and lock into this. Here's what that means, and we're going to go to the next scripture, right? That, that, that if the Spirit is in you and he dwells with us, there is no place I can go where the Holy Spirit is not. Oh, come on, give me some amens, y'all. Tell your neighbor, say, neighbor, if you know God, you can't divorce the Spirit of God. That's very, very important. That's very, very important, right? So lock into this. So now he's about to leave. He's about to leave. He's been raised from the dead. Let me move here. Then his 12 disciples are with him, and he said to them, I'm about to leave, but don't leave Jerusalem. Wait for the promised Holy Spirit. This is in Acts chapter 1. Wait for the Holy Spirit that's promised. When he comes, he's going to show you all things and empower you. Now, very, very important, because when he left, notice what he said to his disciples. Don't make the mistake of going in your flesh. Right? 
Don't make the mistake of going in your flesh and think and fool yourself into thinking, absent me, that you can do what I did. Y'all get this, right? So sit in Jerusalem and wait in Jerusalem for the promised Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit comes, oh my gosh, it's going to be a whole nother ballpark, isn't it? A whole nother ball game. But don't make the mistake of trying to do it in your flesh because you go in your flesh, results are not going to be guaranteed. Come on, come on, say go with Jesus. Come on, y'all talk to me, say go with Jesus. So in chapter 1, verse 4, he talks all about right that. Then, then notice now in chapter 2, let's, let's go there, Acts chapter 2. Then the disciples and the apostles, all the followers of Christ at that time are in the upper room. And then what we see in Acts chapter 2 is we see now the entrance of the Holy Spirit into the earth realm. Look with me at verse 1. Verse 1 of chapter 2 of the book of Acts picks up by saying this. And when the day of Pentecost had arrived, had arrived, this is 50 days after the resurrection, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And it says, cloven or divided tongues as a fire appeared on them and rested on each of them. And I like this. Verse 4, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, we'll clear that up Sunday. We'll talk about that in case you're hung up there, right? Verse 5, it talks about the people that were in the audience that heard these disciples speaking. They were devout men um, from every nation or ethnicity under heaven. And they heard the sound and they came. And we can, uh, you get to verse 14. Peter now, under the unction of the Holy Spirit, begins the process of preaching his first message, right? He delivers his message. He preaches the message. He talks about what happened to Christ, right? And then um, look at verse 41. So those who received his word were baptized, and it picks up by saying, and they were added that day about 3,000. Come on, y'all say 3,000. No, y'all got to get this. Come on, say 3,000. Lock into this. Jesus says to his disciples, the things you see me do, greater than these shall you be able to do, right? He tells them, don't leave Jerusalem, but wait until the Holy Spirit comes. The Holy Spirit shows up now on the day of Pentecost, and one of the 12, one of the 12, under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, deliver the word of God, and one impacted 3,000. Yeah, 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 yeah. You get where he says the things you see me do, right? Greater than these shall you do. When I read that, I oftentimes ask myself, what is our problem today, right? What's the problem with the church today? Are we not flowing in the Holy Spirit? Are we not flowing under the unction or the anointing of the presence of God such that the gospel is going out, but people are not responding, right? If the, because, you see, I think my problem and I think your problem is the same. We restrict the purpose of the Holy Spirit to the inside perimeters of these walls. So here's what we do. We depend on the Spirit for good worship. Come on, y'all. We depend on the Spirit for good preaching. We depend on the Spirit for a prophetic word. We depend on the Spirit for all the miraculous workings of Christ. And, but when we leave here, we act as if the Spirit can't work in the car. We act as if the Spirit can't work in, the, in our neighborhoods. We act as if the Spirit can't work in our homes, in our families, on the workplace. Oh, if God shows up at the work, hey God, I'm at work, you're not supposed to be here. When I check Acts 1 and 8, the purpose of the Holy Spirit, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, is for us to be witnesses. We are empowered for service. Come on, are you with me? The Holy Spirit is not restricted to a good shout and a a good dance and a good amen and a good praise the Lord. Monday, when I saw Jesus in the graveyard raising the sick, he wasn't dancing. Y'all not hearing me. When I saw him feeding the 5,000, he wasn't shouting. Come on. When I see him opening up blinded eyes, he wasn't doing the Shonda, but the Holy Spirit was upon him. And we miss that. 
So listen, listen. Don't make the mistake of restricting the presence of the Holy Spirit solely to an emotional response. I'm going to say that again because we've been conditioned. Don't restrict the Holy Spirit solely to an emotional response. Here you are. Singer gets up to sing. And that singer tickled a little fancy that you've got, that emotional ride. Ooh, Lord Jesus, God just showed up. Well, where was he? Last I check, he is omnipresent. You kind of get what I'm saying? So he didn't just show up once that note came out. <laughs> Are you with me? He was here the whole time. But if all we're depending on is for him to come when the singer hits the high note or the organist hit the right note on the key, oh, God is here, here we go. He's been here the whole time. But if your definition of the Holy Spirit is an emotional response, you're going to miss the greater things. Are you with me? With me? And you wonder why we don't have 3,000 coming in is because the workers are busy dancing. <laughs> workers are busy praising. Nothing wrong with that. Don't, don't misconstrue what I'm saying. Nothing wrong with a good praise. Nothing wrong with a good worship. Nothing wrong with a good song. Nothing wrong with a good sermon. Nothing wrong with a good emotional prayer. All that is good and has its place. But the predominant purpose of the Holy Spirit is not that. I know unsaved musician that can have you shouting. Are you with me? My wife, y'all remember the debarge? Y'all too young for the debarge. Y'all know about that. Amen. Every time my wife and I went to a debarge concert, she catched the spirit. Woo! And she's, oh, thank you. And I'd be looking at her like, I don't give you the spirit, girl. <laughs> Emotional response. You get nothing wrong with that. Please don't misinterpret what I'm saying. I love a spirit-filled church. I love an emotional church. I love all that. But when we get done in here, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Are you with me? And we restrict it solely to that. So what I want to do now is I want to begin the process of connecting the dots. So go with me to Ephesians. Uh, let's go to that last scripture on the screen. Ephesians chapter 1. And I want to explain process. And then we're going to connect it back to our lesson today. Is this making sense to you? Is this helping? Now go to Ephesians chapter 1. And let's, let's flesh this out. A little bit. Say amen when you're there. Look at verse 3. Verse, verse 3 opens up by saying this. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessings in heavenly places. I expected an amen right there. Even as he chose us in him. See how this sounds now like Jeremiah 1 and 5, Jeremiah 29, 11, Psalms 37. See how it sounds very similar to my introduction last week. Even as he chose us in him before the foundations of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. And it says, in love, he predestined us for adoption as sons through Christ Jesus according to the purpose of his will. Back up to verse 3. Blessed be the Lord and God of our Father, uh, blessed be the, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and watch the verb tenses, who has, present tense, blessed us in Christ with what? Every spiritual blessing, where? In heavenly places. Come on, say in heavenly places. Let me, let me take a moment to explain that, okay? And I'm going to use you this morning because I use Shonda. I'm going to use you this morning. Here, here's what it's looked like, Shonda. It's like... Before the foundations of the world, God knew you. And God ordained you to be the holy lady that you are right now. Bless the name of the Lord. Amen? And, and, and so here's what God did. Here's what God did. Before he even thought you up. 
before he even allowed your mommy and daddy to come together to give birth to you. He had this storage bin in heaven, right? And, and this morning I said it was 100 by 100. I'm going to make it bigger because you holy. 1,000 by 1,000. And here's what he has. In that storage bin, he has all the riches that he's ever going to give you. He has blessed us with spiritual blessings in what? Heavenly places. You kind of get what I'm saying. So everything is already there. It's in the storage bin, and he's just watching you. He's just, he's just waiting on you. You kind of get what I'm saying, right? But, but it's already there. Does that make sense? It's not that, that at some point later, depending on how you behave, depending on how you do, depending on how you function, he's adding things to the bin. I wish I had. Because if he is omnipotent, he knew what to know before knowledge was invented for him to know what to know. So he know everything. I wish, come on, y'all, you won't ever do. So he has it all, and he's just waiting on you. Look at the rest of the text. Look at the rest of the text. Look at the rest of the text. So jump all the way down to verse 11. Look at verse 11. In him we have obtained an inheritance. Okay? Pastor Karen, my grandma was off a little bit this morning because I think that that have is in the perfect tense. Right? And let me, you know what perfect means, right? Completed action with ongoing results. I like that better. Because here's what that means, Shonda. If, if you mess up, here's what he doesn't do. I'm going to give your storage bin to Maya. Y'all get that? Because a lot of us, when we blow it, we think we're not good enough for God, and God changed his mind about you. Tell your neighbor, say, God doesn't change his mind. Y'all get this, right? He doesn't change his mind. So the perfect tense says, that thing is there waiting on you, right? And what you do pre him has no impact on that thing that's there, right? So watch this. Watch this now. Let me go here. It says here, in him, um, you also, when you heard the word of truth, well, let me back up 11, you have obtained, we have obtained the inheritance having been predestined, that means before the world, according to the purpose of him who works all things, according to the counsel of his will. Verse 12, so that we were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. Look at verse 13. In him, you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, look at this, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. Y'all, I love that phrase. Let me tell you what that says, okay? When Shonda decides to get right and to give her heart to God, lock into this. Here's what happens. God comes and then he opens her heart and he goes in and he sets up residence on the inside of her. You guys okay with that? So theologically, here's what does happen. The only way she is able to be saved, not absent Christ. It's not like Christ is out here and she's saved and he's waiting. This is going to mess you up for a second thing to happen for him to go in. The only way she's able to be saved is she opens her heart. She confesses with her mouth, believes in her heart, Romans 10, and he steps in and she gets saved. Come on, say amen. So her salvation, her salvation now, this is very, very important. Her salvation is sealed and solidified based on the fact that the Spirit of God dwells where? In her. Now, here's the part that I don't want you to miss. Here's the part that you might have missed theologically. Lock into this, okay? So when he comes, here's what happens. He goes to the storage bin. Shikabahasanda, yeah. And he opens up the storage bin. And he loads everything up. And he says, hey, she finally came to me. Let's go do this. And he comes. And when he steps in, ah, he brings with him every single thing that he has in store. I wish I had somebody here. For her, it resides in her because he is there. Don't make the mistake of thinking. She's saved now. So at some point later, 
Wait, we're going to wait for a second thing to happen, and then he's going to come back in. Then he's going to bring all the other stuff. No, 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 no. At birth. Oh, y'all done got quiet. At birth. That's why we call it born again. Everything that she needs is there. Let me help y'all with this. I, I got a new grandbaby, right? New meaning he's 18 months, and I had some time to spend time with him this weekend. It was just a great, great time. But my daughter graced me because she knew he's going to be my, I can't say favorite because my kids are watching online, one of my favorite grandchildren, <laughs> right? And, and I love, love this kids to that, right? And so here's a, when, when I was there and, and little Nolly was being born, when that head popped out, this was, this was grandpa. Oh, yeah, he got one head. Oh, he got two eyes. Yeah. And he's got a nose with, yeah, he's got two nostrils in there. You kind of, and he's got two ears. So I'm like, good, 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 good so far. Then that little shoulder popped out of there. And oh, yeah, he's got two arms. Yeah. Then his hands came out. Oh, my gosh, he's got ten fingers, right? Then he emerged completely, and the nurse took him, the doctor took him to clean him up and hand him to the mama. Then I wanted to be the first to get him, so I grabbed that little booger after I let his daddy look at him a little bit, you know, <laughs> grabbed him a little bit, and I'm watching, and, and I'm peeking under the blanket because I'm counting toes. Yeah, yeah he's got ten. He's got two feet. Oh, my God, this is all right. And I'm like, yes, everything he needs to be normal on the face of the earth already exists. So here's what I said. His problem is not that he needs something different or something in addition. He just has to learn how to what? Use what he all. You get it. And that's important, Ella Annie, is because when you come to Christ, he gives you everything you need. The problem is not that you don't have it. The issue is you don't know how to use it. And you think it's only for the shout. But it has other purposes. You think it's only to speak in tongues. But it has, I, I wish I had somebody in here. You think it's only for prophecy. But it has other purposes. And because we don't know how to use it, all we want to do is come to church, sing, dance, and shout. And if we don't get our sing, dance, and shout on, there ain't no spirit up in there. Oh, it is. You just don't know how to tap into it. Oh, it is. Because you hadn't learned how to use it yet. You kind of get what I'm saying? Here's an illustration I gave first service, and I just love that illustration so much. I had a little man with me, and at home I have this little music room where I go in there in my quiet time, and that's my worship place, and that's my whatever. So here's what he does when he gets tired of playing with his toys. He points to the room. He points to the room, right? And I will take him and put him in a room, and now he's big enough where he taps on the piano seat, and he sits on the piano seat, and he'll sit there, and he'll just bang, 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 and move his little fingers like he know what he's doing, and sway his head to the rhythm and the beat, and all that stuff, and he looked at me like, yeah. I said, no, nah, brother, you ain't Steve yet, okay? Just keep it up. But he'll do all this stuff. You kind of get what I'm saying. Here's the point that I'm making in that. Five years from now, I bet you what he's doing is going to start to make sense. You kind of get what I'm saying? It's not that five years from now he has to pray for the gift. The gift is already, you kind of get what I'm saying. But if my understanding of what the gift is is, is, is something completely different, I will not recognize what God has given him. And watch this, I will not equip him for the works of service. That little booger this morning, well, it was yesterday, he was in there and playing around and, you know, keyboards, things now, they got different beats and rhythm and sound, and he likes it when it has a drum and a piano going together, and I messed around, put a drum on he hit that thing, doom, chicken. he's like, yeah, bopping his head, I'm like, dude, you don't know nothing, but he's like, bam, and he hit an E note, right? And then he, my guitar is right next to the keyboard, so he leaned over and he plucked the E string on the guitar, and he hit that piano again, then he hit the string, and he's like... E. He didn't know the name, but he noticed that this sound sounded just like that sound. So he looked over at me. <laughs> you get it, right? 18 months. And if I think 
The only reason the Holy Spirit is in him is for prophecy. Come on. It's for some emotional response, and it's not for ministry. I will miss all of God equipping him for what God wants him. Come on, does this make sense? Okay, so here's the point that I want to make. Everything you need, God has already given you. It's up to us to recognize what God has done and get to the place where we learn to use what God has on the inside of us. It's on the inside. Does this make sense? Come on, say it again. Say, repeat it. Say, self. self. It's on the inside. Say it again. Say self. Self. It's on the inside. We just need to learn how to tap into what God has already placed. And here we are, powerless. Here we are, ineffective. Here we are, not having communal impact. Here we are, not doing what God would have us to do because we don't understand the purpose of gifts in the body. So let's go to Roman. Let's go to First Corinthians. First Corinthians. Um, it was brought to my attention that this this next slide has uh, an error on it. So so ignore that, and we'll talk about that. So here's what thing I want to say: Your gifts then were given to serve others, not for personal benefit. Okay, you're not here for yourself. I'll say it again. Well, let me help you. Alternative, say neighbor. neighbor. Uh, you might not like this, but you're here for me, and I'm here for you. Yeah, you kind of get it. Yeah, y'all get it. Does that make? Come on, give God a hand praise. Come on, come on, give my hand praise. Yeah, come on, give. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so quit getting stuck on you. All right. Yeah, quit getting stuck on you because you're in the body, not for you. But for the benefit of us, I'll illustrate this in a little while. I'll illustrate this in a little while, okay? So look at this, and then we're going to wrap this up. First Corinthians, First Corinthians, um, First Corinthians, let me back up a little bit. I want you all to see this before I get to that word and talk about that. First Corinthians chapter 12, let's look at that, and look at verse um, 1. Look at verse 1, Okay. Let's talk this out. We're almost done, and we'll pick this up Wednesday. You don't want to miss Wednesday. We'll go some heavy places with it. Say amen if you're there. Now, concerning spiritual gifts, brothers or sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed, ignorant. Problem with the church today, right? We don't know. So you know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols, however you were led. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says Jesus is a curse, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. Now, there are varying varieties of gift, but the same. You see that? Greek word out too, the same spirit. There are varieties of service, but watch this again. The same curious or the same Lord. There are varieties of activities, but it's the same God who empowers them all in every one. Verse 7. To each, meaning every individual in the body, the manifestation of the spirit uh, is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. And I missed that passive sense in given. You didn't get it. God gave it. Okay? No one is, um, for to one is given the spirit of utterance, of utterance of wisdom, to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit, to another the workings of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the ability to distinguish between spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. And look at verse 11. All these are empowered by the one and the same spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. Let me tell you what that means. I'll back up to verse 7. It's God's business what gift you have. Quit praying for your neighbor's gift. Right? It's God's gift. It's God. Yolanda, you get it, right? It's, it's, it's God's business what gift you have. Does that make sense? So quit praying for your neighbor's gift. You kind of you get, get what I'm saying? I hate using this illustration, but I'll use it anyway. Uh, you've heard me say this before. My wife has a strong gift of prayer, and I believe she has the gift of healing, right? So when people call me talking about, hey, pastor, can you pray for me? I'd be like, girl, if you want this to work, you better come. I'm not going to fake the funk. You kind of get what, I know my gifting. It's teaching. You get it? 
It's preaching, and I have an evangelistic gift. And you kind of get what I'm saying. I understand my gift, and God did not give me the gift of healing. I am alive today because of this woman and because of the praise of the saints. You, when she pray, I feel like I'm not saved. That's how well she prays. You see what I'm saying? I'm one of them guys, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to clean. If I die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. Here she, their Lord Jesus is once and again, Father, in your name we cry our Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Jesus, stop by here. And she got you. And I'm like, <laughs> not that I don't love God, but I'm comfortable in my zone. You get what I'm saying? So I can pray, God, give me her gift. No, 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 no. That's why God made us one. And I'm not intimidated by her gift, and she's not intimidated by mine. Together we make a unified body. Does this make sense? Y'all get what I'm saying, right? Right? So now watch this. Watch the text. Watch the text. It says in verse 7, um, there are varieties of gift. Verse 4 all the way through 6. It talks about the, the enumerated list. Then verse 7 says to each one, uh, to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Manifestation. Y'all say manifestation. manifestation. Say it again. Say manifestation. manifestation. Here has been the church's interpretation of manifestation for too many years, and it has rendered us impotent. We define manifestation only like, say, you, well, you want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I will say to you, pray for the Holy Spirit to come into you. And I'll say, you got to manifest. You got to do something. So until you utter back to me um, tongues or whatever it is you've been praying for, I will say you haven't manifested. Right? Nothing wrong with that, but it doesn't stop there. You get what I'm saying? Right? Or the Spirit of God might be moving um, in the place. And we have a prophet in our midst, right? Um, Elder Annie has a strong prophetic gift. And I have oftentimes say to her, don't be afraid to use your gift when the Spirit of God moves, right? So sometimes when worship gets deep, we'll look for her to watch the word manifest. What is God saying? You kind of get what I'm saying? And we expect the Spirit to manifest out of her by saying, thus said the Lord, some of y'all, yeah, anyway, let me move on. Yeah, you kind of get it, right? The prophet will do what the prophet does. Same thing with apostolic. On and on and on and on and on. Y'all get it? Uh, but, but manifestation transcends that. Very, very important. Very, very important, right? Because here's what the church says. Because here's what you will say if manifestation is restricted to that. I don't have that gift. That's what you would say. I don't have that gift. I don't have that gift. I don't have the gift of worship. I don't have the gift of drums. I don't have the gift of ushering. And the reason you're sitting in the pew rendered impotent and ineffective is because of your definition of manifestation and spiritual gifts. The manifestation is given for the common good. Let me explain and let's go through this. Now, two words, uh, one word, did some work. Here's manifestation, right? To, to cause something to be fully known by revealing clearly and in some detail, to make known, to make plain, to reveal, to bring to light, to disclose, or some sort of a revelation. In other words, i got to see the thing to know it's there. I've got to see the thing to know it's there. I love the B clause because what the B clause says, all these meanings involving a shift from the sensory domain to seeing, causing to see, or giving light to it. It goes to the cognitive domain of making something fully known evident and clear, okay? So I want you to shift your definition of manifestation, then we're going to stop. And, and, and I said, Lord, give me a good illustration. Here's a, uh, the best I can come up with. If you got something better, bring it with you Wednesday. We'll shout with you over that, okay? It says here that the body is one, though it is made up of many parts. Does that make sense? So when you look at me, I have a body, and it is made up of many parts. I'm going to make this statement up front. If parts of my body ceases to manifest, over time, I will die or my body will fail. Okay? So here's the illustration I gave this morning. I'm laying in the bed, and my stomach starts manifesting. It's saying hungry. Right? Here's how the body works. Since it's made up, it's one, but it's made of many members. My brain starts manifesting with my stomach. So here's what my brain does. It sends a signal to my feet saying, he's hungry. You might want to get up. Here's what my feet does. 
It doesn't say, I don't have the gift of growling, so I'm just going to lay here. It has no choice because the body is one, though it's made up of any parts. And once the brain tells the body what it's going to do, guess what the feet does? It starts to manifest, and it gets me out of bed. You kind of get what I'm saying? And I start walking towards the refrigerator. Now, this just doesn't work with brain, stomach, and, and, and head. My eyes starts to manifest. Because my eyes now has to tell me and show me. I wish I had somebody in here where I'm going. So it comes to light and it starts to be fully known. So I know my eyes are working because I can see where I am going. Uh -huh. You get it? Then when I get to the fridge, my arm starts to manifest. So how you know your arms work, Felix? Because it manifests. For the common good. What do you mean the common good? I ain't never seen feet open up a refrigerator. Are you with me? The feet got me there. The brain sent the signal. But the hand holds the refrigerator door and pulls it open. Y'all get this, right? And then the eyes take over because it starts to look. And it sends signal back to the brain, down to the stomach. You want cheese? No. Goes back up. You want some steak? No. So it goes back up. You see the communication mechanism. You want some chicken legs? Yeah. Then the nose starts manifesting. So I know my nose works because my hand can pick up the chicken and I can smell how fresh it is. Watch this. It's all working for the common good. My nose ain't smelling for the benefit of, I wish I had somebody in here. For my nose, it's responding to a need that the body has. And when all the parts of the body work not for themselves, uh -huh. right. I ain't never seen my feet took me a place because my feet wanted to go. Yeah. You get it? I have yet to see my hand hit something. Uh, not her, am I get hit back? Uh, <laughs> I never seen my hand hit something just because it wanted to hit something. Something else was going on that this manifested to satisfy the need of what was happening somewhere else. Common good. Common good. And then at the end of the day, the entire body sits down and goes like this. That's some good chicken, man. Thank you, feet. Thank you, hand. Thank you, brains. Thank you, eye. Thank you, teeth. Glad you got all of them. You can chew now. You got what I'm saying? Thank you, stomach. Thank you, brain. You get what I'm saying? I thank the entire body, not just my tongue, which tasted the chicken. I know this is oversimplification, but lock into this. The church is a body. And, and so we have a hand here. We have a leg here. You kind of get what I'm saying? We got an eye over here. You kind of get where I'm going now? We got, a, we got an arm here. We got a toe. We got a toe here. We, we got a finger over here. Does this make sense? And it's made up of many parts. And, and, and here's the body trying to move. And we come every Sunday and we watch the, 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 the brains of the worship team doing what it needs to do. You hear the preacher says, we've got to go minister. You see the ushers doing what they do. But you've got the church can't move because it's only one leg and the other leg is sitting over there. The other arm is sitting over there. It can't see what needs to be done because the other eye is sitting in the back. And the brain is sending signal, but the body parts are thinking gifts are only for shouting. Gifts are only for prophecy. Gifts are only for certain things. And the gifts aren't being used. And so the body is impotent. Here's a word I used last week. Handicap. Retarded. Because body parts are not functioning well. And so the great physician is releasing word after word. You're needed in the body. You're functioning well in the body, right? Here, here's the thing that I said. Here, here's the very important thing. You've been placed here to realize God's purpose for ministry. And you wonder why 
the world is still hungry for the living bread is because the feet is not taking the body to the refrigerator so it can get something out to eat. And you've got folks starving. And then if the feet do take it to the refrigerator, the hand says, well, the last church tried to use my hand and they hurt me. Ain't none of y'all using these hands. And the refrigerator is never opened. You get it? God places you here for ministry. Last thing and I'm done. I know we're a little bit over time. We're over time, but I'm going to say this real quick. The best way for you to find out what your gift is, is to get in the game. And then while you're playing, you will be positioned in the right spot. You make sense? You kind of get what I'm saying? Okay. While you're playing, you will be positioned in the right spot. Here's another sport I played. I, I, I played softball a little bit, right? Big as I am, I can't hit worse, worth nothing, right? I get, up, <laughs> I, get a, I, get a, I get up to bat, and people be saying, okay, we're going to be fitting to get a home run. Yeah, Lord, Jesus, big boy up there. And they throw that thing at me. I won't miss now. I ain't no punk. Hey, man, I can hit it. Yeah. So, so I hit it. I hit it. But, girl, if it go past you, I'd be so embarrassed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Doesn't matter how hard I swing. I just don't have, this is why I don't play golf. I don't have what it takes to hit the ball. You kind of get what I'm saying? I can't hit it past her. It's worth nothing. But guess what? I can catch anything you throw at me. It's the most amazing thing, right? So I could be a shortstop, and that ball could pop. I got such reflexes. God must have made me. I tell you, he just, he had my name when he said reflex. That ball can come as fast as it wants, and I can catch anything that's thrown at me. So guess what I play ball for? I don't play to hit home runs. I know my position as a defensive player. So when I get on the team, don't look for runs out of me unless somebody else hit the home run. You get what I'm saying? But look for some outs. Because I'm going to catch it, and it's going to get to first base. You get where I'm going? I, I understand that about myself. So, but the only way I found that out is when I got to the bat, and I was starting to make, the coach came to me, hey, Gilbert, we're going to use you out here. You get it? But had I not gotten in the game... The coach would not have known where to position me. You want to know your gift? Get in the game. You kind of get it? You want to know your, your gift? Come on, worship team. Get in the game. And watch what God, watch what God's going to do. Come on, stand to your feet, everyone. Let's stand to your feet. Let's give God a hand praise. Amen. Come on, give God a hand praise. Thanks for your patience. Thanks for your patience. Thanks for your patience. Father, in the name of Jesus, you're worthy, God. You're wonderful. You're awesome. You're great. You are just a mighty God. Thank you for your word. Thank you for what you're doing, God. We pray that a fire will be lit in this place, that we would be about the Father's business, God, that we would not be commonplace anymore. Should there be one here today that don't know you as Lord and Savior, Holy Spirit, draw them to a relationship with you, God. Should there be one that have strayed from the fold, God, bring them back, bring them back, bring them back, bring them back. Should there be one that's been sitting, saying, I don't know what my gift is, God, draw them, God. If there's one that wanted to be baptized, bring them, Lord. Bring them, bring them, bring them. Someone looking for a church home I've been visiting. And now I understand I'm a critical body part. I'm a critical entity to this ministry realizing what it needs to be done. Draw them, God. Let us be unified and be about you. So we give our hearts, we give our time to you that you get the glory. Move in this place, God. In your name we pray. Amen.